All right. Well, you're in for a treat tonight because uh, I've known this gentleman for a really long time. And he is probably one of the best fly tires and fly designers I know. I've actually sat up in his shop and watched him tie some of his masterful pieces. Uh, he's taken an existing pattern from a fella out in Colorado that we all know, Charlie Caven, and put a couple of Bill Shear twists and improvements on it. I think he's made it less glitzy and more practical, more fishable. And as you can see in the picture, he's probably got four or five different versions. He even went so far as to do a single hook version for any of you that are afraid of tandem hooks. So uh, he's got the bases covered here. Yeah. It'd be a very interesting tie. And uh, Bill, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the group and thank you for taking time to share with us tonight, Bill. Uh, my pleasure. It's uh, it's the best thing you can do on a cold night in April. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to get started here. This is, if I can get in focus there. This is an Umpqua version of the baby. So what Umpqua has done is they've downsized it. This is a six on the back and a four on the front. So they've downsized it from, from Charlie's original baby. And I'm sure that has to do with the uh, economics of the situation of making the pattern. So that's, uh, that's the smallest one that I have. I was able to get my hands on that one. This is my version of the baby. This is a two and a four and uh, it, uh, I, I, this one is tied as, uh, as described by Charlie. I talked to Charlie and told him what I was doing. And he said, oh, he said, uh, that's probably a really good idea given your water. So um, as, as most of you know, I'm in Northern Wisconsin in a headwaters area and we don't have a lot of real deep water. Therefore we, uh, I found that by using the weighted version of the fly with that extra 15 wraps of 30 thousandths wire in the back was just too much. It was too heavy. The fly was going down too fast. And I've, I found that that, that 3 16th bead in the center of the front hook is uh, more than enough to get me down into the uh, strike zone for the small mouths. So um, here's the... Uh, Here's the single hook version. And this one is made with a, uh, a synthetic head. Um, uh, I made a dubbing brush um, out of uh, a piece of craft fur that I had. Don't ask me where I got this, I don't know. But it's some of the coolest craft fur I've ever seen. Um, and then this is the only piece I have, so I'm going to I'm going to try to source it out and find some more. Uh, but I don't know. I don't even know who gave it to me or where it came from. Uh, but it's, it's really great. I was able to take that material and mix it with some uh, um, golden brown ice dub and made this dubbing brush, which uh, I, I really love the colors in it. It's outstanding. Um, as per the original, this is uh, Australian possum or uh, fur with uh, with a little bit of pearl ice dub in it, and that that brings me to uh, something. For those of you who were trying to source some of the materials, I got to tell you, it was really confusing to me at first. This is. Ripple ice dub, ripple ice hair, and ripple ice fiber. So you got to know what product you're dealing with. And this pattern deals primarily with the ripple ice fiber. So, uh, and, and these, these two, the ice hair and the ice dub, are much different. So you got to be careful what, you're, uh, what, what you picked up 
for, for making the pattern because it won't come out right if you use these guys. So uh, I, I just wanted to, to maybe clear up some confusion that some of you may be having there. Um, the mallard flank feather that uh, we use, this one's just dyed wood duck color. Um, when I strip this down, I wanna strip it down to where the, uh, where the quill is relatively small in diameter. So uh, I just peel this stuff right off and get it out of my way. Now, if you'll notice, I chose a feather that was A, really long and B, uh, very rounded on the tip. So if you were going to, this, by the way, I think is the most economical way to get this stuff, the barred mallard flank from Wapsi. Uh, I can usually find about two dozen feathers like this in the package, in this, whatever this is, quarter ounce package. Um, and most of the time we're getting these for, for doing uh, Catskill style dries or something. And when we're doing those feathers, we're trying to find a feather that's as flat across the top as possible so that when we pinch that down to make our dry fly wing, it's gonna sit properly and everything will be the right length on top. But we're not, we're not looking for that with this particular pattern. So using these feathers that you normally would throw away is uh, a, a great way to uh, use up a product that you may not have a use for. The, um, the one-aught version, this is a one-aught and a two. Uh, this is the one that I'm going to tie tonight. I think it'll be... Uh, uh, a real nice version of it. I, I do like that, that synthetic head. I think that little bit darker head uh, really stands out well, looks great also. So there's, uh, there's plenty of possibility. The, the Daiichi hooks, the 2461s, that's, uh, that's the, the hook of choice. And it's one of my favorite hooks anyway. Um, I, I really like that. And, and of course, those of you who know me know that uh, I'm always looking for a fly that I can find that'll swim in the deep end of the pool. So I had to take one and supersize it into a three-aught front hook and a two-aught back hook, which makes this fly somewhere around about six inches long. I did have to substitute marabou for the uh, mallard because the mallard just isn't long enough for a fly that size. And then I also made my dubbing brushes out of Arctic fox fur so that I could fill out the fly properly as I moved up the size scale. So uh, this one I think is gonna get a little pike exercise here in a couple of weeks. I'm uh, getting pretty anxious to try that out. So let's start here, I've got my size four hook in my vise. I'm just gonna start at the eye and run my thread back uh, about a third of the way down the shank, somewhere right about here. If I start going too fast, let me know. So at this point, I'm going to take a little bit of ice dub in a holographic gold. Throw a little dubbing wax on the thread. I'm using uh, 140 Danvilles in white for this pattern. And we want to make a, a pretty solid little ball of, uh, of dubbing on here. So I'm going to wrap this right over the top of itself. There we go. 
And then right behind that is where everything starts getting piled on. So I'm gonna take one of my, my mallard plank feathers and I'm gonna tease that out from the tip. And I'm gonna wrap this on same way if you were doing a, a space style or a, uh, an intruder or something like that. I'm gonna trim this off so that I've got this little triangle left. You can see that little triangle right up there. And I can tie that in right there. And a triangle will keep the feather from pulling out. And I usually take about three, maybe four wraps around this. Mallard can be a, a real unruly feather. So trying to keep everything going in the right direction can sometimes be difficult for you. It likes to wander around a little. Now I'm gonna take my ripple ice fiber and I'm gonna use three colors. I'm gonna use white, I'm gonna use sand, and I'm gonna use the olive. And don't think that you have to use these colors. These are just the colors that I chose to use um, because when, when my season starts up here in a couple of weeks, uh, a real white colored fly tends to work the best uh, when the water's still real cold. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm planning on. I'm gonna use about eight fibers of each. So I'm gonna start with just about that much white. I'll put about the same amount of the sand color in, which if you hold the sand up next to the gold, there's definitely a difference. But if it's just in the bag all by itself, it sure looks like gold. So for whatever reason that is, they call it sand. Once I get all three of these piled up here together, There's my tail. So I'll tie that in on top. And then I'll lock it in. I'll just pull it back over the top of itself and lock it right down. And if I have, if I have too many errant pieces hanging out, I might trim it a little bit. This one came out looking pretty good. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now I can take my dubbing brush and on this one, I'm gonna use the white on this end. You could do this in a dubbing loop, but uh, the brush is, for me, I'm, I'm gonna make more than one fly. So the, the brushes just make it a lot easier for me to, uh, to get a little production line going and makes it faster and more consistent. And quite honestly, if you did this this right, you could uh, you could fish this fly just the way it is, and you'd have a nice little pattern.
There, half done. See how easy that was? I'll take a little bit of the Z-Mint. Just a little dab there. Oh, by the way, if you take your dubbing wax and the, the first time you open the, the jar of Z-Mint, put dubbing wax around the rim up there, the lid will never stick. I'm gonna take my, my 14 thousandths intruder wire and I'm gonna use that as my connecting wire. I tried 18 thousandths and I, I just wasn't happy with it. I, I didn't like the way it moved. It was a little stiff. So I, I downsized into my smaller diameter intruder wire. I'm much happier with the way it works out. I can take care of that junction later. Now we'll switch over. Everybody with me so far? Is that a glass or plastic bead that you used on your wire, Bill? Uh, this is this is actually the same bead that I use on my intruders. Uh, it's a uh, it's a quarter inch uh, fluorescent red bead. Um, you can get them just about everywhere. Okay. I I like it because of the hot spot. Um, I, I really believe in that that hot spot. It's uh, it's a lot a lot uh, better of a of a um, cider for the for the fish. It's easy for the fish to see it, and uh, it it draws them right into that hook point really easily. If if it's right there between both hooks, chances are they're gonna uh, get that hook in their mouth right away. I gotta get a wire cutter here. So now I want to try to keep my wire on top of my shank. You don't want that to, to spin around on the shank. You want to try to keep it on top. And you want to keep that 3 16th bead uh, right about in the middle of the hook shank also. So I'll usually just take my, my tag end of my thread and hold that bead down so that it makes it real easy for me to maintain the pressure on that bead and put it exactly where I want it. Then I can take off my tag end. And on this hook, you can go down to the barb with your thread. You don't want to go down past the barb, but if you stop at the front end of the barb, that will keep your thread from pulling down too far onto the, uh, onto the back end of the hook. Now here is where Charlie wants you to put on 15 wraps of 30 thousandths wire. And like I said, Maybe in other parts of the world, that's a good idea. But uh, where I'm at here, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for me to put that much weight on. It's, uh, it's not doing me any favors. Plus that that fly becomes like the, uh, the ultimate clouser then too. You smack yourself in the back of the head with two hooks, you'll really know it. <laughs> So now I can wrap on uh, another one of my uh, mallard flank feathers. And on this one, usually on this flank feather, I'll, I'll choose one that's got a little bit shorter uh, 
barbules to it just because I don't need all that that extra. Well, Bill, before you get into the mallard, could you share with us what you do to keep that back trailer hook from twisting? How do you control your loop on your intruder wire? Well, I, I've got it. I, I've got the, the bead tucked up against the, the hook eye now, but when I move that forward, you see how that stands straight up there? I, I tied my wire in to make it do that. And, and like Charlie says, when you're when you're finished with the pattern, if you stick your scissors in here and just spread that out a little bit, that'll keep your your wire from uh, tightening down too tight, and it'll it'll allow the fly to move more. So you can and, you can accomplish that by leaving the wire on top of the hook, or do you tie it onto the side to keep that loop open? It's it's tied right on top. Okay. Yeah, if you use a smaller diameter wire, it's not a problem. If you start getting into the bigger diameter wires, then it becomes more of an issue. Uh, when I did that, that two out, three out one, I went to the to the eighteen thousandths wire, and that was uh, that was a little bit more difficult to handle. Probably what I would do in the uh, future is I would do a uh, a, a piece of uh, like 140 pound test solid stainless and make my own uh, uh, shank where I would pass it through the hook eye on the front end and then just have a loop down at this end and slide the bead on, slide it over the loop after I put the fly on and then the looped portion of the, that solid stainless I would put through the hook eye. But we'd be dealing with a much larger diameter hook eye so I would have plenty of room to do that. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Now, um, at this end, when I when I go to put on my uh, my next piece here. This is where the mallard can usually get pretty ugly. Yeah, that didn't turn out too bad. And then I'll run, I'll run some dubbing up there and it kind of all depends on what mood I'm in as to what color I'm gonna use. I usually use uh, either silver or pearl. E either way works out pretty well. And I'm gonna dub right up to the B. And I like to use the dubbing fairly loose. So I'm not gonna try to put a, a, a big hard piece on there. I'm gonna leave it pretty loose so that I can comb it out a little bit and uh, get a little bit more flash out of my body.
And what is that, Bill? Is that like ice stub? That is, yep, that's exactly what it is. That's that's pearl ice stub. Okay. Now, since I had this happen once and I didn't like it when it happened, I'm going to hit this with a little bit of uh, Z-Man. Um, I, I, had, I had about a five pound smallie hammer the fly, got hooked up on the front hook, and another one about the same size tried to steal it out of his mouth, got hooked up on the back hook. And I had two roughly five pound smallmouths of duking it out with each other and they ended up ripping the fly in half and I didn't get either fish. <laughs> but uh, it was a good lesson for me that uh, I really needed to, uh, to make sure that I secured that, uh, that wire in the front a little bit better. Uh, one more mallard, and we'll uh, we'll put on the wing then. And this one, I usually use just a couple of wraps on this part. Bill, would UV glue work as well in that? Um, you know, I tried UV glue, and I wasn't happy with it because it built up a little too much. So uh, it, everything has its place. And uh, for me, the, the UV glue just wasn't the right choice uh, in this situation. I love using UV glue, but it just wasn't, it wasn't the right thing to do here. Now I'm gonna put on a little bit of my darker possum and then I'm gonna put the wing on. What do you have mixed in with that brush to give it those speckles on there, Bill? That's part of that that piece of uh, of material. That's craft fur. Yeah, it's part of the craft fur. Wow. It uh, it's got all that built into it, which is really nice. Where did I hide it? Here. So if you look if you look closely, you can see how those longer hairs yeah. are, uh, are barred. And they almost and then, have translucency to them. Yeah, and then the softer under fur is the stuff that's, uh, that's that kind of a tan color. Okay. Well, when you get that sorted out, let us know because I'll probably give you a call for a couple pieces of that. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know if it comes this size or not. This is the biggest as big a piece as I got. It's about a four and a half inches long by about two and a half inches wide. I did have some fun. Uh, I took a piece of this and I, I cut it about a quarter of an inch wide like this. And just like the other craft for backing, I was able to grab this thing and pull it tight 
And I said, oh man, do I like that? That, that is like, that looks like a little bug body in the water. I could, uh, I could do something with that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play around with some of this stuff too. I haven't, I haven't had much of a chance yet, but that, that looks pretty cool to me. Yeah. Okay, now I'll go back to my, my ripple ice fiber. And I'll do the same color wing that I did before, about, about eight strands of each color. And this gets tied on uh, as a V over the, uh, over the back. And I've, I've always been uh, a big proponent of, uh, of tying a V-shaped wing because it does uh, a really great job of pushing a lot of water without um, changing the profile of the fly very much. So uh, I, I was I was glad to see that, that Charlie had incorporated that into his design. Uh, it's uh, it's a great way to uh, to make things work for you. As soon as I figure out where I put the rest of this stuff. There's my wing. I'm going to tie this on top, but towards towards me. Then I can flip the other part over. And put it just exactly where I want it. So this is almost like a delta wing. Yes. I'm going to rotate my vise here. There, you can see the top of the fly now. It's it's definitely has a, a split to it, but it's uh, it's laying up uh, on the sides, but more on top. Piece hanging up there. There we go. And it's it's a little unruly. It's a little ugly looking, but um, that doesn't seem to uh, to bother the the fish at all. That they uh, they don't seem to have a problem with that. I, I've got a couple of patterns. Uh, one of Der Jerry Darkus's patterns, uh, the the meat wagon, is the same way. I mean, it's about the ugliest fly I sell in the shop, but. When that fly gets wet, that material lays down and it looks so much like a chub, it's not even funny. So, uh, so this kind of scraggly look doesn't look like that in the water. And I think that's something that we kind of lose sight of. We see all these flies tied in a specific style and they're all magazine flies. And we go, oh my God, if it doesn't look like that, it's no good. And then you get to a fly like this that it's just kind of, you know, it more resembles a dust bunny under your bed. Um, and, and they turn out to be wonderful patterns. So, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that the, the fish aren't uh, scrutinizing this the way that uh, us humans are. So now I'm going to wrap, I'm going to wrap, uh, if I wrap two hackles, if, you know, to keep, give it a darker color, then the bottom one, I will strip on one side like this. So this would get teased out from here and Charlie recommends wrapping them together. So usually what I'll do is I'll put two of them, one on top of the other, grab the tips, Tease them down.
Keep my little triangle down there so I can grab everything well. So your top fly, your top feather is full. And right, my top to feather is full and my bottom one is half. Okay. And then at, at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll grab it with my hackle pliers so that they, they don't twist on me. Is there any geometry to right-handed, left-handed tires, which side of the feather they strip? Uh, yes, you want to you want to strip the side that would lay down against the shank. So that would be uh, the if you're looking if you're looking at the feather this way, that would be the the left hand side of the feather. Because you wrap these on good side facing forward. Correct. Okay. more out of it. There we go. Then I'm going to put uh, another little ball of ice dub in this spot um, because I want that inside of that fly to, to really glow before I put on the, um, the head. So this will kind of be underneath of the head, um, kind of like doing a, a, a mini bulkhead. So how critical is color at this juncture, Bill? Just something neutral? Yeah, um, I, I just want something that, that's shiny. Now, you know, I, I, I've never presumed that your water is going to use the same colors as my water. I fish in pretty tan and stained water, so I can get away with uh, a flashier fly than, than somebody else who's fishing in clearer water might have to, uh, to take that into consideration. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm just trying to make the fly stand out. I, I don't necessarily um, mean that you have to make the fly this color. I, I wanna leave that up to the tire themselves to, uh, to decide what color they need to make their pattern for their waters. So once I have this on, then I can come in with my, my dubbing brush and I can finish out the head with my brush. I'm gonna take a couple of extra wraps of thread here so I can taper that down pretty well. So we need to pay particular attention that you tied that up your dubbing ball a, a little bit. That's right. I, I, I went back on top of the dubbing ball a little bit just so that I could, uh, I could get that hair to flare up real nice. And that's, that is part of the, 
I don't know, allure of this pattern is that I can, uh, I can play with how big a head I want to put on this fly by how big a dubbing ball I put behind there. Um, maybe in your particular region, you've got bait fish that are more streamlined. So you wouldn't want to put as big of a dubbing ball behind there then. If I was uh, if I was fishing the Emerald Shiner uh, run in late summer, I would probably not use this big of a head on the fly. But if I was fishing uh, in the springtime when the chubs run, like they do in my neck of the woods, then putting on this larger head makes all the sense in the world. I bought a brush the other day and decided it wouldn't take many brushes to pay for that uh, jig that you have to make brushes. <laughs> we're uh, we're just we just about got the uh, the new CNC machine set up, so I think probably in another week or week and a half we'll uh, we'll be back into production with the the fourth generation of the uh, extreme dubber. This is where everybody goes crazy as far as uh, deciding exactly what the fly needs to look like. You can get scissors happy in a hurry. Uh, anybody who's ever done a Puglisi fly knows what I'm talking about. There's, uh, there, there comes a point in time where it, it's real, real simple to wreck a fly. Now I'm going to put a little UV on the front end here. All we need is some eyes. So I've got some five millimeter eyes here and my good old trusty E6000 that I consider to be the best um, cement in the world for doing this kind of stuff. Give it a little dollop on both sides, get them about even. I'll nab one of my eyes on my bodkin like this. There. 
So you it's just like that. We got to fly. So you drive the glue into the the fur head and then just set the eye on the outside. You don't want to crush the profile. Correct. I, I, I stick it down onto it a little bit, but I push the glue down inside. If, if I did it right, the glue will meet in the middle of the head and form a, a semi-hard, not hard, but the, the, I don't know how to quantify that. A, 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 a pliable, a pliable interior, but yeah. it'll hold the shape of the head. Right. I think a lot of us have put the glue on and then we squeeze the eyes together to try to get them to touch the hook shank and we change yeah, leave them, leave them apart the like that. Yeah. And those eyes will stay on pretty good like that. Yeah, it's not often, even on my musky flies, it's not often that a fish will take them off. Every once in a while we lose one, but it, you can always glue on another one, but it, it doesn't happen. Uh, real often. You know, are, you maybe. Of, are you much of a fan of building up a, uh, a UV, a UV like mask on the head of a fly? Are there applications where you do that? Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, just delivered a half a dozen uh, pink and white six inch long deceivers for a customer the other day. And uh, I formed those heads with, uh, with the, the UV cement, you know. So something like this. Okay. So yeah, there there is a a, a use for that, but uh, but on a pattern like this with a softer head, and even even my 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 crushers and so on, uh, those uh, I don't I don't build up much of a UV head on them. Now something like. Um, uh, there's a deceiver with the, the baby smallmouth. Uh, that that does real good with the UV. And, and I'll put on. I, I usually I'll put just a dab of the uh, of the super glue on first to hold the eyes in position, and then I'll put a little bit of UV on the top and hit that with the with the torch. And I'll do the same thing on the bottom, just a little bit, hit it with the torch. And then, uh, then I'll come back and I'll, and I'll fill in top and bottom and torch the whole thing. And then I'll coat, my, the, my third layer goes over the eyes and everything. And that way um, I've, I've got a, a really well cemented head and I don't worry about that falling apart. Cool. So there's your swim coach, guys. It's uh, like I said, I, I took a lot of the mystery out of the fly. Uh, there was, uh, prior to my writing that pattern sheet, there was no pattern sheet on this fly at all. It didn't exist. Now, so, is it is it me or or is this fly devoid of possum? This fly has got possum in the back. Okay. I put the possum I'm a little too tight here. Let me back up. Um, so, so back here is the possum. Up here is the uh, the synthetic. Okay. And that head is all craft fur, or it's craft fur in combination with some some flash. Uh, craft fur and some ice dub. Okay. And I, I mean, it took me. God, I don't know, five minutes to make the, the brush. Yeah. There was nothing to it. It's just, you know, put put the put the craft fur down. I left about maybe an eighth of an inch of the butts hanging over the wire. I put all the 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 long side to one end, like so. Uh -huh. And uh, and then over the top of that, I just put a little bit of the uh, of the ice dub and twisted it up. And, and it, 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 I mean, it makes a beautiful brush. I'm really happy with the way it looks. It's just. Uh, Impart a little wisdom to us, Bill. Uh, 
few secrets about making brushes yourself. I assume wire is critical. Yeah, I prefer the wire. I know guys that are using uh, braid. And the problem with the braided brushes, when, when you use the, the, the braided fishing line for the brush, um, it's a one-shot deal. As soon as you take that thing off of the, the um, dubbing brush machine, it's going to twist up. It won't stay straight. Uh, and most guys are using somewhere around a uh, 16-pound test uh, braided line. So that's about the size of 4X, uh, give or take a little, which is a little bit larger than the 6,000th wire that I'm using to make the brushes. Um, I, I actually use 5.8 thousandths just because uh, my wire supplier, that's, uh, that's what I can get from them. Uh, I, I, I could get exactly 6 thousandths, but it's a lot more expensive. This way I can keep the cost down. So the wire needs to be malleable to agree to, not too brittle, right? Yeah, this is untempered stainless steel wire. It's uh, safety wire. If, if you know what safety wire is, they, they, uh, you see bolts that are, they got a piece of wire through them. That's yep. safety wire. Okay. And, and most of it is much larger diameter than, <laughs> than what we're using. They just happen to make it that size also. I, I buy it uh, by the pound. So a one pound spool of uh, 0.0058 wire is a little over three miles of wire. Wow. Which is, uh, that kind of keeps it out of the general consumer's hands. <laughs> <laughs> and then I made a machine that wraps it onto a regular uh, thread spool. Yeah, you got those cute little wooden spools that are nice. Yeah, and that, that little holder, the first, the first right. time I, I dropped the spool on the thread uh, on the shop floor one day, I'm hanging on to the end of the wire, and it unravels all the way across 30 feet of floor. <laughs> right there, I said, I got to fix this. Because <laughs> if, if I did it, everybody else can do it too. So that's when I invented that little spool holder. So why don't you share with us what's going on with you this summer? I mean, uh, some of us that know you pretty well know you've, you've, you've had a little bit of a medical issue. You, you're on the tail end of that now. Your shoulder's getting better. Uh, are you working this summer? Are you guiding? You have open spots if anybody wants to come up and dabble with you? Uh, yeah, I am guiding. I, I have cut back. I, I'm, I'm down to about four days a week now. Um, uh, the raft business has taken off by leaps and bounds. So uh, I've got a lot of work backed up right now. I, of course, my surgeries took, uh, took me out for about three months. So I got three months of work backed up on me right now. And fishing season is looming. Uh, I do have some open dates. I don't have a lot, but I do have some. Um, and, uh, so I'm, I'm building rafts and guiding both. Uh, my, my original plan was, uh, I know I can't row a boat forever. Uh, I just turned 65 this year. So, uh, I'm, I'm, nature is slowing me down, even if, uh, my mind doesn't want to, but my body does. <laughs> I think some of you guys can uh, appreciate that. Anybody who knows what that's about, right? <laughs> so, uh, so my my plan, my original plan was to uh, was to to ease off on the guiding and segue into the raft building, and uh, um, my surgeries made me ease off on the guiding. I wasn't expecting the raft business to take off the way it has. So, uh, so that's uh, been kind of a, um, a, a, a help and a hurt at the same time. It, it's, uh, it's a lot of work trying to switch from one business to another uh, when everybody still wants you to do both. Right. But um, I'm, I'm managing that and uh, I'm, I'm getting 
I'm getting to the point where I've, I'm starting to feel a, a little comfortable with it. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to quit rowing a boat completely yet, but uh, I, I do, uh, I am kind of cherishing the thought of being able to uh, take myself fishing every once in a while. There you go. <laughs> so for the sake of people that don't know you as well as some of us do, tell us, you know, what you fish for primarily and how we go about getting in touch with you if we want to go up there and uh, take a boat ride. Okay. Well, I'm in, I'm in uh, Boulder Junction, Wisconsin, uh, the heart of muskie country. So naturally, uh, I, I do fish a lot for muskies. I've, uh, I've been fortunate to have started in the muskie fly fishing game pretty much um, well ahead of most other people. So I've, I've got a, a whole lot of years of experience. I've been, personally, I've been fly fishing for muskies for about 45 years. Um, I've been guiding for muskies for about 30. I've got about 6,300 muskies landed on the fly um, of various sizes, of course. Um, Wetieit.com, www.wetieit.com is uh, my website. You can get a hold of me through there. My email is wetieit at wetieit.com. Um, so uh, what do I fish for? If it's got fins and gills, I'm in. Uh, yes, I love to fish for muskies, but uh, brook trout are, are very near and dear to my heart. I love uh, our, our wild brook trout that we have up here. Um, I have places where we will on occasion land a 18 to 22 inch brook trout in rivers, not lakes. Um, smallmouth bass, I do a lot of smallmouth bass fishing. They're, uh, they're a wonderful fish to catch. They fight like crazy. They're, uh, they're more gullible than a muskie and it, that takes a lot to be more gullible than a muskie. So uh, that, that's a good thing. A lot of anglers love smallmouths. Uh, I, do, I do a fair amount of walleye fly fishing and uh and occasionally some pike fly fishing also but uh I, I haven't been able to steelhead fish for the last three years in a row due to health issues uh, i still have not cast a fly rod since uh last october so i'm looking forward to being allowed to get back into that i've still got another couple of weeks and i think i'll be able to trout fish Thankfully, uh, our musky season doesn't start until Memorial Day weekend up here. So I've got an extra month of uh, recuperation before I have to start swinging a big rod. Um, I have a lot of fun doing this. I've been fortunate to be in this business, I think probably at the best time to be in this business. And uh, it's been a good life for me. And I, I certainly appreciate uh, what other people have, uh, have done for me and helped me out. Uh, I got in when many of the, the great fly tires of the 20th century were uh, at their peak. And they, they took me under their wing, they helped me a lot. And for that reason, uh, I, I believe in helping others as much as I can, in, in showing you things like this in, uh, making fly fishing not only fun, but taking a lot of the mystery out of it, trying to make it a little simpler so that it's easier to understand. Um, this is an ancient sport, been around for tens of thousands of years. So we can, we can have a lot of fun with this without getting too mystified by it. There's gobs and gobs of information available and you can go as deep as you want to. So it's, uh, it, it's a lot of fun from that respect. I do wanna touch a little bit on, uh, on what's gonna happen here in the next uh, month or so. So our, our fishing season, trout season starts in the UP this weekend. Uh, that includes the border rivers uh, with Wisconsin. They, they also open this weekend, a week ahead of the regular trout opener 
throughout the rest of the state. Uh, and of course, uh, northeastern Wisconsin, for the most part, is closed to early season Wisconsin catch and release uh, season, with the exception of a few selected places on a few selected rivers. Um, and, and the reason for that is because our trout in this part of the state don't escape the reds, the fry, until somewhere around the middle of March, some years later. Last year, they probably didn't escape the reds until early or mid-April because of the cold early season. So we don't, uh, because Wisconsin has a, a wild trout season, we don't wanna crush those eggs or kill those fry by wading through shallower parts of the stream and inadvertently lowering our fish populations. Um, Northeastern Wisconsin is considered US 51 to the state line to Highway 10, um, roughly somewhere between Highway 8 and Highway 10. Uh, the DNR kind of calls it Highway 10. And then east all the way to, uh, to Lake Michigan. So um, I happen to be on the very western edge of that. Uh, and somebody in Green Bay would be on the very eastern edge of it. So uh, those streams are more protected than what you'll find in uh, those of us who are re uh, year-round residents up here called uh, the rest of the state tropical Wisconsin down there in the southwest. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a completely different climate than what we have here. So, um, so we're going to see our trout fishing. Uh, generally speaking, we don't get much for insect hatches until about the middle of May. So for the next two or three weeks, um, it's going to be a whole lot of some nymph fishing, a lot of streamer fishing, and some very large trout will be migrating back towards their summer water. Our, most of our trout here in northeastern Wisconsin migrate anywhere from 15 to about 40 miles one way downstream every fall, late fall, after they're done spawning. And they do that because it's, the water isn't deep enough in the headwater streams where they spawn. So they have to drop back into the deeper holes or they'll freeze to death in the wintertime. So uh, with the exception of a few fish that might hang around in uh, spring holes and things like that, uh, where there's uh, a, a better water temperature regime, most of these fish drop way back into the walleye water for the winter. And the, wind, and the walleyes might drop back to a reservoir or into a bigger, deeper part of the river themselves. So uh, all summer long, the trout then chase cold water upstream. So as the summer warms up, the fish keep moving farther and farther upstream. And when you know it, by about the middle of August, they're in their spawning waters or very near to their, their home waters where they were born. So uh, nature has devised a plan that allows the fish to migrate all season long at their leisure rather than running upstream and killing themselves like salmon or steelhead do. So it's a, it's a much, um, much easier time for the fish and the fish reach their spawning sites in their best condition of the year so that they can be more prolific. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have literally millions of wild brook trout in northeastern Wisconsin. Um, some areas of some of these streams have gotten warm over the years. And uh, we now find uh, small pockets of fish rather than fish just everywhere. Even though the water might look great, it might be just eight or 10 degrees too warm for the fish to be comfortable in. So it'll be a small family group where there's a cold enough uh, area for the fish to live in. And then you might go quarter of a mile, half a mile, a mile before you find another family group of fish. So um, these larger streams 
tend to uh, have those types of populations in them. And those populations tend to move. Uh, as it gets too warm, they'll keep going upstream until they find another cooler spot to be able to, to stay in. So that that kind of covers uh, what our trout do in the springtime. But then we also have fish migrations from northern pike and from walleyes and from smallmouth bass. We have some superb smallmouth bass fishing over really big smallmouths. I mean, four to seven, eight pound smallmouths, the big pre-spawn females that are moving into certain river stretches where they're gonna be for the next three weeks or four weeks. Um, once the water temperatures get right, they're gonna spawn and then they're gonna drop back into a bigger part of the river or into a reservoir and leave those, uh, those fry to tend for themselves, then for themselves. So it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time of the year for everybody up here uh, because so much is going on at the same time. It's, uh, it's rather exciting to be able to, to fish over huge populations of, of smallmouth bass where you know, in a three mile stretch of river, there might be eight or 900 smallmouths and, you know, 40% of them are these big pre-spawn females. Once I see the, the bass starting to pair up, then I'll lay off of those river stretches. But as long as the, the fish are feeding heavily, and it's one of the reasons why I was so excited about this fly. You take one of these, that's about four or five inches long, that's not too big of a meal for a five to eight pound smallmouth. Um, some years we've used flies that are six or seven inches long for these smallies because they won't touch the, the little stuff that we normally would throw for springtime smallmouth fishing. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool to, uh, to, to live at the top of the hill and to experience these things. Um, so, Bill, with this, well, with this swim bait, with with the swim coach, how deep are you fishing this, and what kind of lines are you using to pull it through the water? Generally speaking, I'm going to use a uh, an intermediate tip line, so a Cortland Ghost tip or SA and, and Rio, all three of them uh, have uh, uh, some some sort of line that's got an intermediate tip on it. Cortland invented the clear intermediate line. They have the patent on it. And the reason why most other companies have given up on the clear intermediates is because Cortland's not sharing. <laughs> and they've got a line that stays supple even in cold water and the other guys can't figure it out without <laughs> <Okay>. patent infringement. <laughs> so you're getting like so, three, to, three to five feet down? Yeah, but most of this water is only three to five feet deep. Okay. You know, uh, up here, a deep hole is five feet or six feet deep. Got it. Most of these rivers where these fish are coming in to spawn, they're coming into headwaters areas that are less than five feet deep. Okay. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it can be pretty fast water because the, it, it's, uh, it's pretty rocky. They usually, like to be in those ripples and so on. Uh, it's weightable where you can gain access, but a lot of these rivers are difficult to access unless you float them. Uh, but if you're only floating in a couple of feet of water, that takes some specialized watercraft. That's why I've got the rafts. Sure. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, fly this size here, which is about maybe six inches long. That's a really good springtime musky fly when the musky season starts. Uh, incidentally, in the UP, the musky season is open year round. That doesn't mean anything until the water temperatures get up around 60 degrees when the muskies are going to start to spawn and move into shallower water. But that's going to be way before the Wisconsin season opens. So I can take advantage of that too. So uh, a, a perch sized a colored crusher fished across the rice flats in, uh, in some of these shallow lakes uh, is just killer. And, and I can sight fish for these fish. I can pull along in the boat 
just like I'm sight fishing for redfish. And, uh, you know, we spot a fish and it, it's taken me a number of years, but I finally got it figured out. You don't throw ahead of the fish, you throw behind the fish because muskies aren't dummies. And uh, if all of a sudden that minnow drops out of the sky right in front of their face, they're like, nah, I don't believe that one. But if it lands behind them and they hear that flop, uh, they don't know that it just fell out of the sky. They, they think that maybe it a little minnow or a bait fish, you know, jumping around somewhere. So what do you have available as far as any open dates? When should people consider giving you a ring? Did we lose him? Are you still there? Uh oh. The screen's still up. Yeah. We'll give him a minute. Give him a minute. He got a call. He's up in Boulder. What they do? Bold, up Boulder Junction, not Boulder. Right. Hey, PJ's here. And Donna. And Donna. Oh, look at her. Yeah. What are you guys on separate floors? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think That's we lost Bill. Dropped out. I'm guessing he has, uh, I'm guessing his phone connection broke his internet connection. Yeah, that's exactly back what up, I thought. Hey, hey, back. There he is. Hey, there he is. Back. 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 We'll, we'll, we'll have broadband by the end of the summer, and then I won't have this problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I had before we lost you in space. Uh, when and where can these guys get a hold of you and and what what do you have left as far as a handful of openings for anybody that wants to go up and dabble? Ooh, I don't know what I got left. I, I, without looking at my calendar, I've, I've probably got about uh, probably about six days left in May, um, just a, a three or four days left in June. July, there's probably about seven or eight days. August uh, <clears throat> is, is not nearly as filled up. Uh, big changes happen up here in August. August uh, is actually about the middle of August is the start of fall up here. So uh, the smallmouths drop out. They won't be uh, real accessible to, uh, to shallow water fishing anymore. Their tactics have to change. But the muskies, the big females, start getting a lot friskier. So, uh, so we do have some uh, advantages to August also. We start to see uh, we start to see some pike activity pick up after the, the hot summer. Springtime is real good for pike and fall is real good for pike. Summertime, the water temp just gets too, too hot and the pike shut off. Muskies, that's a different story. They'll, they'll stay going, but the pike will, will really slow down a lot. When's the best uh, time to go walleye fishing? Uh, walleyes are real good in the spring and they're real good in the fall. Uh, in the summertime, there are, there are some places that I know, as long as the water's not too hot, um, the walleyes will be right up in the ripples. So uh, I, I, can get, uh, I can get some pretty good walleye action usually um, throughout the summer months, as long as, as long as the water temp stays uh, in the low to mid 70s, we're okay. As soon as it gets above maybe 73, then the walleyes get locked jaw with the pike. Uh, again, you can reach me here at the shop. I'm always in the shop on Saturday. I never guide on Saturday. So I'm always accessible in the shop here on Saturday. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty easy to find me. Obviously, people call me at 8.30 at night. So, <laughs> um, like I said, wetieit.com. Wetieit at wetieit.com is my email. My phone number, 715-385-0171. Um, 
email me with questions. I don't mind. I, I get probably 10 or 15 questions a day from people asking about gear or uh, um, fishing conditions or, hey, I'm coming up at such and such a time of the year. Well, what should I bring? What should I look for? I, I don't mind answering those questions at all. Um, you know, I, I do the same thing. If I'm going to go fishing somewhere, I call somebody up. And, and talk to them. Uh, luckily, a lot of people know me, so I can uh, I, I can get away with a, a few liberties. <laughs> um, but you can reach me on Facebook. I'm pretty active on Facebook. Uh, Muskies on the Fly is uh, one of my Facebook pages, so uh, you can you can find out a lot of information on that. I've got a, a YouTube channel that has a lot of uh, real unique. Uh, fly tying uh, uh, techniques on it. I, I, I'm not going to sit there and, and tie a woolly bugger and show everybody how to tie a woolly bugger. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. But there are uh, certain techniques that I've developed that, that make it easier for you to do some of these things that, uh, that, are, that are rather unique. Um, and 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 very, very effective. Um, one of the things I want to touch on is um, we're in an era right now where we're really, really educating fish, over-educating fish with our flies. Just like with casting baits, uh, the fish have been over-educated. And, and you're seeing uh, casting baits now become smaller and smaller in size because as the fish get um, more educated into the fact that, hey, you know, if I eat that big thing, it stings back, but if I eat a little one, it doesn't sting. So uh, as, as I've developed over the years, I've, I've found that there's a lot, lot of fish out there that really don't want, uh, you know, to eat this 10 inch fly anymore, no matter how uh, sexy it might be, they're they're much happier going after the the six inch fly because that's something that that isn't getting fished as much by uh, fly anglers uh, when we're talking about muskies in particular here. Um, so so the the fish get to to be. Um, a little easier to uh, attract with some of our smaller baits rather than uh, going after them with the great big stuff that we've been using because they're getting on they're, they're getting wise to that it's just like you know the tarpon in homosassa you can't catch a tarpon on a fly bigger than three inches anymore because they know that the those big baits sting back so they're not they're not going after them as much so uh, that's something to keep in mind uh, is, to, uh, is to think more about how educated our fish are becoming. Uh, we know muskies live to be 30, 40 years old or more. Uh, and just like the tarpon that live to be 60, 70 years old, those fish are, are not dummies and they have life experiences that they're drawn on. So, uh, so that's something that we really want to keep in mind when we're when we're out there fishing, just because uh, two years ago you used a, a a bait that was much larger, maybe today, in, especially in those hard fish waters, those fish are much much more um, educated today. Uh, we see the same thing in in trout fishing. You know, on the major tail waters, if you're using anything bigger than an 18, they don't touch it. You know, uh, they're, they're eating 20s and 22s because the, the possibility of them getting hooked is much lower than it is if they eat, you know, a 16 or a 14. So, uh, so think about those things when, when you're fishing uh, and, and consider the amount of pressure that your fishery has and how you can adjust your style to be more successful in those fisheries also. Very cool. Does anybody have any more questions for Bill tonight? 
Well, my friend, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And an evening like this is is the coup de grace. So uh, you knock it out of the park. Thank you very much. I I, I enjoy it. Uh, I, I I I I turn people on to you guys all the time from from your neck of the woods and send them to you because you you guys are are really doing a great job. Uh, with with drift it's uh it's a wonderful fly club and uh and i really appreciate the opportunity to uh to speak to some of your members well it's always a pleasure we're happy to have you back anytime and for any of you guys that are remotely on the fence about fishing with this guy me and a few other people in this club can speak of personal experience of time in his boat, well spent. Uh, it is a day where you will come away not only satisfied, but educated. Uh, he's a brilliant guide. He's fun to spend time with. He's abundantly knowledgeable as you can see. And uh, I can't think of a better way to spend a day up in the North Woods than hanging out with you. So uh, again, thank you, my friend, always a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you again. I hope you re get completely recuperated and you're out there kicking butt like normal. My doctor promises me I'll be rowing by May. There you go. <laughs> well, good luck, Bill. Thanks a yeah. lot. Take care of yourself. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, Bill. Bye now. Great. 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 Thank you.